magnetic sensor. And I'm not a material scientist, I'm an engineer. So I would like to mention the idea if you want to go from a single sensor to actually a full sensor system. And let me check for the next slide here. This is actually the outline of my talk. I learned that I should talk about for half an hour, maybe up to 45 minutes. So whenever there's one of these big bullets is, is ended and I can also stop. So I will make sure that I talk at least for 30 minutes, but not more than 45. Uh, the idea is that first I would like to give a short introduction on a new type of magnetic sensor called magnetoelectric sensor. Uh, but I don't want to stick too much into the details of, let's say, material science stuff or others. Um, I would like to make more a step back and look from a certain distance on this sensor principle. And then um, I would like to go to an entire sensor system. This means that we learn about how to, can, how to do readout for this specific sensor. But this, this readout principle, it's mainly a, um, a frequency conversion scheme can also be used for a couple of other magnetic sensors. So if you try to understand how an OPM sensor, optical pumped magnetometer is actually working, or even um, a flux gate, then the same principles are actually used because they all need some sort of frequency conversion. So this is the second point about uh, potential readout schemes. And then of course you face a couple of problems. I try to mention them and I try to show also you some solutions to this. And the solutions are listed here like anti-field approaches, so-called carrier suppression, and then also um, noise cancellation and multi-X readout, for example, multi-mode um, readout. And if there is enough time, I, I give also a short outlook. And these pictures here, they, they show actually what, what is actually mentioned here in Kiel when you talk about sensor systems. So of course, there is the sensor itself. This is very often done a, a field where material scientists are working. So they, they produce material um, such that, well, something is created, usually a voltage that is proportional um, to a magnetic field. But then in addition to that, you must also look from the other side, for example, from the people that would like to use a single sensor or a multitude of them, for example, medical people, and they don't have the detailed knowledge about whatever is, is going on in the material. So they would like to see it in a more simplified um, version or view. And also um, over here, they, they just wanna use them in the typical environment where they're in. So shielding, for example, is not a good idea um, if this is required. And also if you need cooling, this means also um, it's, it's kind of expensive. And all these issues, they should be addressed when you look at the full sensor system. And I try to, as I said, make a step back and then uh, look in more detail on the, well, on readout schemes and stuff like this. Okay, so um, whatever I present you here is not my work. We have a so-called CRC, a collaborative research center here in Kiel. Uh, we just got, got funding for the next three and a half year. And actually these are the people that are depicted here, they have, um, made the work. And I would like to mention here actually um, three people. Um, Christine on the one hand, you see her here and Eric and Jens. They have actually done all the, or most of the, of the results that I will show you. So if you like the talk, then blame it on them. And the rest is the team that is a bit changing over the years, but they, they actually work on these magnetoelectric sensors over here. They stem from material science, from engineering, from medical parts. Also um, physics is, is involved there. So it's a kind of multidisciplinary um, approach that we do here. Okay, now we come to the first part and you always see some pictures here. So this is for example, a, a typical house that you see here in the in, in Kiel and, and in the environment of Kiel. So it's actually an open air museum, but, but quite often you see these houses. What is also typical for us is the background. So the weather is very often raining here. From time to time we have a nice day, but well, we have also some rainy days. Okay, so first of all, I would like to mention the basics of magnetoelectric um, sensors from a kind of far away perspective. So I will make models uh, or one model or a couple of models of this sensor. And when we talk about models, then this, this first sentence here um, is, is actually, um, well, it, it shows what a model or how a model should be. It should be as simple as possible, but as complicated as necessary. So you should, it should cover all the relevant aspects, but not more. This is then sufficient in order to explain um, how the sensor works and also how to find out how you could improve it maybe. 
And the second thing is that, in, especially in, in the field, how we are working, that hierarchical models are actually a good idea. So if you are, let's say, in the details of the sensor, then maybe boundary element or finite element methods are good to, to model the sensor. But if you step back and you see it, let's say, more from an engineering perspective or even from a user perspective, a medical uh, user perspective or a biological user perspective, then also the sensor should, should, should be high or the model should be higher in, in abstraction layer. And usually what you have in these models is a mathematical description that's essential for system theoretic approaches that, well, you have also some mass stuff that you can use, but also you should visualize it in order to understand it and also to have some examples or measurements that prove actually that your model is, is valid in some sense. And we will start with a simple model of a magnetoelectric sensor. We have actually a couple of different, um, well, let's say principles or readout schemes. I would say actually four, but since we have just half an hour, I just mentioned one principle in detail and the second one shortly. So let's see. And this is how the sensor looks like. I mean, this is actually, um, this is, uh, this, this coil is actually wrapped around the sensor quite often because we need some extra field for measurement purposes, uh, for calibration purposes, but also for for extra stuff, as you will see in a minute. And the sensor itself, I hope that you see my mouse, is this little tiny thing here on top. There is a printed circuit board here. Usually we put also, meanwhile, the amplifiers on this board, but the sensor is just this little cantilever that you see over here. And this example, it's a cantilever of three millimeters times one millimeter, and the, the, the thickness is pretty thin. And there are actually two or, four, or three parts. Silicon is usually the, the basement of everything. And then we put a magnetostrictive layer consisting of FECO zip, so iron, uh, and silicon, bore, and, and, and cobalt. And for the piezoelectric layer, we, we use um, at the moment aluminum nitrate, so as a, as a piezo layer. And here you see a little video how this is, how the principle of the sensor is. So first you start with a magnetostrictive layer. This is the blue one over here. And if you apply a magnetic field to this layer, then you change the size of the the volume or of the layer. So you map the magnetic field onto um, a deflection or a size change. And then you can put this on a cantilever and the cantilever is clamped on the one side. So if now an, an electric and a magnetic field is exciting the sensor, then you see how it moves actually in this, in this way. Uh, so now you have created some kind of waving board, but if you put on top or on the other side a piezoelectric layer, and then actually you can, you can measure this deflection by mapping the deflection into um, a voltage. And so you have this magnetic deflection, deflection voltage mapping. And in the middle is a mechanical um, part. So you can also use the mechanical resonance of these cantilevers and exploit the gain of, of, these, um, of these things. So this is the, the very simple words, I would say the, the principle of the sensor that we have here. The interesting thing is it's a kind of, in my perspective, cool sensor because it's pretty small, it's pretty cheap, um, it doesn't need any cooling, as for example a squid that is much better on the one hand, but also much more expensive. And also we can handle very large um, disturbing fields. For example, an optically pumped magnetometer, an OPM sensor, is quite often uh, there's shielding required because the magnetic field of the Earth would uh, would, would, would make the sensor to go into saturation and you cannot measure anything. This is not the case over here. The problem of this sensor principle is that we have not yet reached the sensitivity that is necessary in order to do the um, medical stuff that we would like to. On the other hand, we are close to, uh, we have a couple of, of clever people over here. So I'm, I'm pretty sure that in the next three and a half year, we might reach, for example, the cardiologic um, level that is required in order to do um, recordings of the um, magnetic recordings of the human heart. Okay, now we should come to a model in order to understand um, readout principles, because usually you wanna have the sensors to be pretty small and small means in the mechanical resonance that you climb up the frequency axis. And then um, on the other hand, the, the signals that we are interested in biological or medical signals, magnetic signals, they are pretty low frequency. But first of all, a model now. So we have here actually three components. 
One is pretty simple and the other ones are a bit more complicated. The first one is that we say we have here at the beginning a magnetic field B of T, so um, T is the time uh, variable. And then we, we can actually model the effect of, of this mapping from field to deflection by one of these curves over here. So it goes into saturation for large negative fields. It goes into saturation for large positive fields. But in the middle, then we have some sort of a, I would say a square characteristic. You can describe it. If you say that lambda in is the, um, is the deflection output or the length change output by means of a curve that you have a plus bx plus, B plus um, c square, cx square and so on. So a couple of powers of well, it's not x, it's b in that case. And the most important part, which I think here in this, in this center area is actually that we, we, we create something that is proportional to the square of the magnetic field. Okay, this is not including now the, the cantilever itself. And the cantilever can be described by a mechanical resonance. So now we have here a second filter actually. Uh, this is a different curve. So the x-axis is now a frequency axis. And the y-axis you can see as a sensitivity or a gain axis. And since this is a resonant behavior, we have some sort of Lorentz curves over here. So in, in, at certain frequencies, you have really a large um, yeah, gain or, or amplification. In others, you have a lot of, of attenuation, actually. And there are a couple of modes. For example, in our cantilever with the small size, the first resonance mode is at a frequency of around uh, seven kilohertz for this small size. And at the beginning, I thought that the second mode would be then at twice of this frequency, but that's not true. So the second mode here is resonant at around 50 kilohertz, and then you have a couple of more of these modes. So now you are in the mechanical um, resonance, including the cantilever structure. Then you are at this point. And then the last thing, the um, piezoelectric layer is simply a linear mapping, more or less where you map this, this deflection onto a voltage and you simply have your uh, a constant factor that is actually changing the unit of this. So this is a, a simplified model which covers everything that is required at the moment, but it's, it's not more. So there is no whatever volume effects that you have and so on. This is not covered in this simple model. Um, I mean, Franz is listening. Franz is our Delta E expert. So I have to mention as well um, a second mode. Uh, here I will be rather short because of this um, time restriction, but a different way. And we have actually a couple of ways how to read out the same sensor here is the so-called Delta E principle. This means um, there is a cantilever and the, the resonance behavior, the frequency response of this cantilever is influenced by the magnetic field. So in, 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 to be more precise by the Young's modulus. And what happens now is that if you have there um, an electric input, so you can excite the sensor via the piezoelectric layer also in the inverse direction that you put there a voltage on it. And this makes the sensor actually vibrate a little bit. And then you read out this and then you check, for example, if it if something happens here in the resonance, so there is a little fluctuation in the frequency response. And if you excite in the middle of this um, or somewhere where there is a steep part of the curve, and now if the, if the uh, magnetic um, field is actually changing the frequency response, this is something as if you would replace the omega in the, in the formula, in the, in the frequency response formula with something that is omega times one plus and then something that is proportional to the uh, magnetic field. So it's something like a Doppler effect in some way that you stretch or compress the frequency response of the sensor in dependence um, of the magnetic field. This is called the Delta E principle. And this means you excite electrically such a sensor and you read out electrically. And the system in the middle, the sensor is actually manipulated by the electric field. It's also something that you can exploit. And as I said, there are a couple of more um, potential readouts. We have surface acoustic waves readout, or we actually can use the inverse um, effect. So we go on the previous slide, the, the chain in the other direction. This is also possible, but for the moment, I would like to stick for the first two. So this is um, 
the sensor principle. And now we could come to potential readout schemes. And now we go one step further. So now we are at the point where we want to look at the sensor from the perspective of an entire sensor system. And this means we should also include um, the signal of interest. And now it depends for which application you want to use the sensor. And over here, I just said, well, let's do it for a cardiologic application. So you are, you're interested in the properties of the heart and the signal uh, of the heart, and you want to measure the heart in, an, in a magnetic fashion. Therefore, I have depicted here in the lower side um, uh, a signal that might stem from a human heart. Um, you see here in the middle around zero, a peak. This is called the QRS complex. So medical people have just named it according to the, uh, to the letters. So, so Q is the smallest point here, R is the highest, and S is the, is the other one. This is um, the signal that appears when your main chambers of the heart are contracting. Then a current is flowing through this muscle, and this creates also a magnetic field. Over here, we have about 100 picotesla as a peak amplitude. This is actually um, the signal of a very uh, strong sportsman. So actually um, someone who's running marath marathons and they have actually a large um, amplitude. This is measured directly above the skin. So, but without touching the skin. A normal person like myself or, or others would have, I would say peaks in the range of 20 to 40 to 50 pico Tesla as a peak value. And then you see here two other parts. Uh, there is a certain so-called wave, and this is a smaller one. This is called the P wave, and this is called the T wave. P wave um, appears when your pre-chambers are contracting. And if your main chambers are relaxing, this is this part of the, the T wave. OK, so this is the, the signal here in, or depicted over time. And we talk here about uh, this repeats, I would say, once a second if you have a a pulse of, of 60 per minute. If you are doing sports, then of course it's quicker. The signal is not changing much. It's more that uh, the, these, these peaks are appearing in a more dense fashion. So it's, it's not that the signal becomes stronger. If you, if you compute a Fourier transform, so a frequency analysis of the signal, then you get um, the stuff that is depicted over here. I have not depicted it here in, in um, Tesla or Pico Tesla per square root hertz in the sense of an amplitude density. I just depicted it here in dB in an engineer's fashion. So um, 20 dB means that the amplitude um, is, is multiplied by a factor of 10 or divided by a factor of 10. And if you check where is the most energy of the signal, then you see it's somewhere between zero hertz and maybe 50 hertz, and then maybe something else. But I would say if you are interested in cardiologic signals, and then the main, the main thing happens between 5 hertz and 30, 40 hertz. And then the last diagram here is the time frequency analysis that you also know which part creates which frequency. So the, the axis is here a time axis. You see it from, well, in the same fashion as here. So the peak actually creates here this yellow bubble. This means this is the highest amplitude here, about 60 dB in the logarithmic fashion. And you see it somewhere between 0 and 40, 50 hertz. The second wave here, the, the T wave, is actually creating just low frequency parts. So if you are interested also in this, then you should even focus on, on on lower parts and these little um, signals, sometimes they are stronger, sometimes they are weaker. They produce roughly or excite roughly the same frequency response than this. So they are located over here. Okay, from a perspective of a sensor system now, you know now that you should, um, well, look for or measure very low frequencies. And unfortunately, the resonance behavior that we have for the sensor um, is for example, with this small sensor at around seven kilohertz, so far away from this. And then a direct measurement is actually not a good idea to, to do it. And this principle, what I just show you now, is also used in optically pumped magnetometers or in flux gates. It exploits just that you create there an additional field and that you can map an addition towards a multiplication with a little trick. So, what you see here in these three boxes, this is just the same as we had before. This is our model of the sensor. And the problem would be that if we would like to measure now a heart signals, we would see nothing because it's not sensitive enough. Now, what you can do is you can exchange the original medical signal, cardiologic signal B, 
by some addition here and then you create something that is called B tilde here. And what you create there is you wrap around the sensor, for example, a coil, and you create an additional field. This means you don't measure only the signal of interest. You measure an addition, something that is here a cosine signal, cosine carrier of omega zero. And now it depends whether you're an analog person or a digital one. I'm a digital signal processing guy, so I like to create the stuff here with a computer. And then we take a good AD converter and then we are able to, to generate here this cosine signal. I have multiplied it here or used it with an amplitude of one, but of course you can scale it with any constant C over here. Okay, so now at this point you have here the signal plus the cosine, and then you have this nonlinear characteristic here. And if we say that for the moment, mainly it's something that is proportional to a square of the input, and then you create something at the output here, that is this, the, the magnetic signal that you would like to measure, B plus the cosine to the power of two. And this is something like A plus B to the power of two. So A square plus B square plus this two AB term. And I omit now A square and B square and just say, this is actually B times the cosine. And if you multiply something with a cosine, it just means you shift it in frequency towards omega zero and towards minus omega zero. And now if omega zero is somewhere in the resonance of the, um, of the cantilever, then actually you, you move this signal. And also you can boost it. So if I would um, bring here 10 times cosine, then also the 10 will appear in this center term over here. So any gain is also um, used over here to, um, well, to boost actually the desired signal. However, then we have our signal now, not at the low frequency um, component at this point here at the output, but at a higher frequency. So we must do some shift back actually in there. And this is also easy. This, this ends in, in conventional um, modulation um, approaches, anal uh, amplitude or phase um, modulation. And then you can also apply a, a conventional amplitude or phase demodulation in order to do the readout. First here, a uh, frequency idea. And again, you see now that I'm uh, an engineer, signal processing per person. So I like to work in the Fourier domain. That's a natural domain for us. So this is actually the input that you see. Here is the frequency axis of omega, the positive part, the negative part. Any real signal has a conjugate complex spectrum. So if, for example, the hard signal would look a bit like this, then you see it here in this mirrored version. This is around zero hertz going up to 50 hertz, I would say. And then you have this, this cosine carrier, a very strong peak in the spectrum, for example, at around seven kilohertz. Now, if you apply this, um, this squared characteristic, so B plus cosine to the power of two, you get actually a B square characteristic, a cosine square characteristic, and this, this product of B and the cosine. Okay, the cosine square could be written as well, a half plus a cosine of two omega zero. So actually then when you square this, you create um, a frequency at, if it was seven kilohertz at 14 kilohertz plus a constant frequency. So this means you create this, this peak here around zero and this peak here around um, two omega zero. And then actually you, you shift um, the signal. This means this part here is shifted by the cosine and you create this in the resonance of the sensor. And on the other side, hand, you have something like B square. And this is, uh, this is the low frequency signal, but squared, so convolved with itself. So you see also something that appears over here, which is twice as, as large or in, in terms of frequency as before. So if you have created their frequencies up to 50 Hertz, then they will cover a range up to 100 Hertz. However, there is afterwards coming is coming the mechanical resonance of the sensor. So this means this part here is actually amplified and the other parts, this one and this one are attenuated. So you just see this kind of signal and that's actually a shifted version of the original signal. That's the basic idea here. Good, so now it gets more complicated, but I hope that we created this diagram step by step. So uh, the sign generator and, uh, and uh, the AD converter are old stuff. This was here, the first three boxes was our, our model. Then we go into an analog to digital converter. So we would like to use this signal or, or, or process it by a computer. Of course, you can also do it in an analog fashion, but 
once again, I'm a digital signal processing person. I prefer to do it on a computer. And then we can do the opposite. So we would like to get back the signal from this high frequency range down to the low frequency range. So we do a demodulation. This means we multiply again with this cosine carrier, and then we, we put there a low pass filter afterwards. And I explained this, I think, in the easiest way in the spectral domain. So this was the original signal. We have already discussed it. And then we have created the spectrum after the nonlinearity, also discussed in two slides before. Then we apply the mechanical resonance of the sensor, which means the low frequency part and the high frequency part is attenuated. And if we put this omega not directly at seven kilohertz, but maybe a little bit below the resonance, then one of these sidebands is actually stronger and the other one is weaker, or we could put it in the middle. And then if we apply the demodulation, we actually shift the whole thing back towards zero and in the other direction. So we create again, um, this part is actually shifted back and the other stuff at minus omega zero is also shifted in the other direction. And then all the, the weak or the positive or, or attenuated components are kind of adding up to um, a symmetric spectrum here. And then we have this extra stuff that we don't want. And this is the reason why we apply a low pass filter just to get back the original signal and attenuate this part. So this is actually after the demodulation, hopefully the same as the, the heart signal at the input. Okay. And uh, for the delta E stuff, sorry, I'm, I'm already a bit out of time now, but I think we didn't start at four o'clock exactly. But the demodulation is actually pretty similar. We do also a demodulation, also a low pass filter. And maybe if there is an offset created, because there could also be linear components and then the cosine will survive and go back towards zero, then you could also apply here a little bit of a high pass filter that just removes the stuff, let's say at frequency zero or one hertz. So the, the constant part should be, should be um, thrown away, but that's also possible. Okay, um, I explained it pretty shortly and um, in the sense of an amplitude modulation, of course, there is also a phase modulation. So you can also do um, the same principles that you know from uh, yeah, radio transmission by means of phase modulation and demodulation. And you can simply check what is stronger. If they are both at the same time and the same strengths in, in terms of SNR, then do both modulations and demodulation and add them at the end and weight them. If one is stronger than the other, much stronger than the other, just use the stronger one. That's the idea because you don't win much. If you have a very good SNR um, scheme and a bad one, then it's better to use just a good one. Okay, uh, next part, solutions or problems. Problems is actually pretty short. The solution is the more interesting part. As I said, Kiel is a sailing city. So, um, I mean, maybe some people of you think about coming to Kiel. If you like to sail, then actually it's a good place here to, to do this. Uh, I didn't mention the, the picture before, but I hope to, to select also a nice picture of Kiel. This is made during the Kieler Woche, so sailing week in Kiel. And then a couple of, of competitions in sailing are done here in Kiel. But let's go to the problems now. This is from this perspective here, um, more interesting. Well, um, you have not only desired signal components, there's a lot of other things going on. For example, there's usually a lot of noise is, is, um, is available in typical rooms like hospital rooms. In a shielded chamber, you might, um, well, keep the undesired magnetic fields outside, but this usually increases also the, the complexity of the whole thing. So not every hospital would like to have a shielded chamber and also a magnetic sensor is not the only medical device um, that you want to bring to a patient. And also the other equipment might disturb the stuff. Uh, next thing is, um, I said that you can actually boost the signal of interest with a stronger and stronger carrier signal. But the problem is um, the AD converter has just a limited range. So the more you, 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 you the, the larger you make it, also the, well, the, the closer you come to the overload point of, of AD converters. But actually this carrier idea has also some drawbacks. And uh, the last thing is that external fields, magnetic fields might also influence any kind of working point of, of magnetoelectric sensors, which I have not yet touched, but there is this case. And the solution to this is a couple of, of methods I will try to present you, uh, well, two or three, and then I stop also here. 
Another picture of Kiel, this is actually um, in the center city. So we have a northern and an eastern part in Kiel. And in the middle, there's a, a we call it the Förde, the fjord. And this is the, the bridge that you can open if a, if a ship would like to enter, then you open it. And otherwise, it's a pedestrian bridge that is close to the railway station of, of Kiel. Okay, um, Christine, for example, I mentioned her at the beginning. She's working on magnetic shielding. So the idea is that you make the shielded chamber smaller and just put it around, well, depending on what you want to do, either the object that you would like to measure. We have, for example, cell analysis. And then you can say, well, at least in a certain area, we put there either one Helmholtz coil pair or also um, three different Helmholtz coils around the sensor and create a field that is opposite to the field of well, that you don't want, for example, the magnetic field of the Earth. And there's usually um, a control system working that measures with the sensor the field, and then you create in a, in a, in a slow fashion, actually, um, a field that is opposite to it. And then you cancel, you knock it out in, in a certain way. And you can also do this, for example, with periodic fields as they appear um, from power controls, for example. So in our business here 50 hertz and multitudes in your part of the world it will be 16 hertz and 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 others and this works quite well the problem is you need very good amplifiers otherwise you would create additional noise around the sensor but um, if the coil is good if your control mechanism is good then it's actually a way to to keep this uh, to keep the undesired field away and if you make it even smaller that you just wire it around the sensor and if the sensor is just um uh, just just measures one direction, then also you need just two coils. And you, you should hope that the other signal is not disturbing the sensor too much. So then you cancel only one uh, signal component or field component. Okay, another way is uh, the problem that the ID converter could be overloaded by the carrier signal. So here is our ID converter. And the problem is you measure now the field of the um, well, of interest, of interest, plus this strong carrier signal at around 50 hertz. And usually the ID converter has maybe plus minus one volt as a, as, a, as a range. And then it has, for example, 16 bits or 20 bits or whatever. You, you can also buy um, ID converters with 32 bits, but you cannot trust all these bits. So I would say that 20 bits is currently the maximum that you can achieve. And one bit means 60 BSNR. So you add a little bit of noise, quantization noise, and also amplification noise with this stuff. And now, now, of course, you must make sure that the signal fits into the ID converter. And if there is a strong cosine signal, well, then the peak must, must go into it. And one idea is now that you have here an analog adder. And before putting it into the ID converter, you create a signal that is just uh, has the same frequency. Um, but it's opposite in, in amplitude, so you, you cancel it out. And this is quite nice because you can use the sign generator that you have used over here and simply manipulate the gain and the phase, the amplitude and the phase with a little control system. And then you create here an additional output, which is of, of very good quality and in the sense of, an, of a sign signal of the, of the noise. And then you add it before the AD converter. And then you can reduce the range so that you have more bits left for the small signal. I'll show you here an example. So here you see um, um, a frequency axis centered around 900 Hertz. So here the frequency in Hertz. And then you see here the, the um, magnitude spectral density in volts per square root Hertz. And um, first of all, you have um, no carrier suppression. This is how I call it. And then you get this very strong carrier here. This is the the red curve plus two signals that were created magnetically. So um, we created a 10 hertz signal. And then you see the carrier in the middle and 10 hertz on the, on the one side and 10 hertz on the other side, these um, modulation spectra. So actually, this is the signal of interest and this as well. And the well, one is a bit stronger than the other one. And then you see a couple of other peaks, for example, this one at 900 hertz. This is a multitude of 50 hertz. So this is some undesired signal. And now you create actually only this carrier signal, but you can do this, what is, what is done over here also for the 50 Hertz and multitudes of it. But first of all, we create here a carrier signal and then we sub subtract the carrier signal. 
And then you see it goes down by a couple of, of, of magnitudes here. So this is actually um, a factor of 10, so 20 dB. And this is another 20 dB, so it's, it's more than 60 dB reduced. And now while before this was the, the maximum range of the AD converter, and now you can reduce it. So actually this would be the maximum range. At this example, of course, the signal is stronger, but usually we look for very weak signals. So this means that now the strongest signal component is actually the one that determines the range of the AD converter. So this helps also a lot such that, that the, um, the quantization process that happens when you go from the analog to the digital domain, even if you use a good AD converter, um, doesn't uh, destroy the, the quality of the, of the signal. And now I should be um, a bit quick here. The next thing is that um, the fields of interest, for example, the fields of the brain or of the heart, or maybe of cells or whatever you're interested in, they decay very quickly. So if you go with one sensor, for example, here close to a heart, I mean, this is a chair that we can adjust in a certain way. There is a little plastic torso in it and within the torso, there is a, a coil. So we create here an artificial heart signal with a coil. And then we put one sensor where, we, let's say if you wanna measure at my heart, uh, my, my brain, then you put one sensor somewhere over here. So very close to my skin and another one, for example, a bit further away and I think in this example, they were about 20, 30 centimeters away. And this means that both sensors measure the noise in the room. They, it's not the same noise, they are slightly different, but it's correlated. So to, the one sensor has usually something to do with the other sensor, but the, the signal of interest, for example, the heart signal is measured only with this sensor. And the other one is, is of course measuring a little bit of a heart, but not much. And this could be used for a cancellation approach. So now you have two sensors, kind of a noise reference and a sensor that has the desired component plus uh, noise. This is the so-called primary sensor, it has both. And then you have here this noise reference sensor. Uh, we do most of the processing here in the frequency domain. So we go with an analysis filter bank into a couple of subbands. In our case, the supporting points on the frequency axis are somewhere in the range of half of a hertz or a quarter of a hertz. And then per hertz, we have a couple of, of adjustment parameters here. So in total, this leads to, I would say to something like a thousand or 1500 parameters per sensor. And they were adjusted based on a gradient based method. So you, you measure here the output and you try to minimize the mean error power. So the mean power of this, of this point. And this, this leads to the fact that the noise that you measured with the one sensor comes very close to the noise that is measured with the other sensor. And then you can subtract it. And so you can cancel it. This is actually the best way. If this works, pretty nice. If not, then you can apply statistical um, methods like a so-called Wiener filter. And they, um, they attenuate, they, they actually make a, a time frequency decomposition. So very dense in, in frequency, but also a lot of time points. And for each time frequency point, you find a weight somewhere between one and zero. If it's one then, or if, if there's a good SNR, you choose one. If it's um, bad then you choose a value close to zero. And people like Wiener or Kalman, they find the optimal weights based on the cost function. And then you go back to the time domain and you get a clean signal. And just one result, and then maybe I conclude the talk um, with a short, um, well, conclusion. But here you see on the one hand, uh, a short term power in red and a short term power in blue. And you see it before and after the subtraction point. So it's basically the red one is the primary sensor. And you hope that everything is, is good over there. But if there's too much noise, then you can start this cancellation. Cancellation is started here at zero seconds. And then you see here it's 25 seconds. And so we start from scratch. So first, none of the parameters is adjusted. And then we, we start this gradient based method. It's a real time method here. And then after I would say uh, three, four seconds, we have adjusted all the parameters. They follow permanently. And then you create a difference that is actually about yeah, I would say um, 30 dB smaller than this. So, and here you see it in the time domain. So, um, and this is now just something around 20 um, seconds. So in this area here, I have made a snapshot of the signals that create these two short term powers. The red one is the input and you see a lot of noise there, 50 Hertz um, stuff and so on. 
And after the cancellation process, you see the blue line. And then you see that there is actually a low frequency sign component below. And this was our 10 Hertz um, test signal. So one period is roughly, it's not roughly, it's exactly, excuse me, um, 100 milliseconds. And I would say in the, in the blue signal, you can, you can recover this 10 Hertz, but it will be hard to see this 10 Hertz component um, in the red signal. Okay, and I, I think now it's, well, I should ask Shashang here. Do I have an extra minute or two, or should I conclude the talk now? No, no you have time. Uh, go ahead. <laughs> this is what the professors usually say, <laughs> but the PhD students, they say, what is he doing? But anyhow, I make it pretty short. Um, I mentioned first that we have a couple of modes, and usually there is a resonance behavior, and the Q factor of this resonance is pretty pretty high. So we have Q factors of 1,000 or 500. However, we have roughly the same Q factor at the first mode, the second mode, the third mode. And now if you look for the, for the widths in, in Hertz in frequency, then the higher we go to the modes, even if the, um, if the Q factor is constant, the widths actually is increasing, the absolute frequency widths. And this means now we can use a couple of carrier signals, and not just one, but a multitude. And the more space we have, so the wider this, this peak in the frequency range is, the more carriers we can produce. And so over here, we created a couple of carriers in the second mode, and then we combine the different um, readouts. So you do, for example, for uh, 50 kilohertz, one carrier, for 50 point whatever, five kilohertz, another carrier, and maybe one for uh, 49.5. So you have three of them. You do three times uh, an amplitude demodulation, three times a phase demodulation, and then you can combine actually um, actually six signals. All of them have the same signal of interest. It's always the hard signal, but the noise comes from different um, frequency regions, and it comes from different, either from amplitude or from phase. So they are more or less uncorrelated. So you win something like the square root of a factor of six if you combine all of them together. And the more carrier you, you use, all well, the better you get, actually. So this is um, how it works. So you see here now a, a different perspective. We look now at the delta E principle. So you see here the frequency axis, and then you have a very narrow first mode, and then there's a couple of dots over here, and you have a second mode, which is wider. So the, the frequency dense here is the same as here, but here we talk about a range of seven kilohertz, and here we talk about a range of uh, around 50 kilohertz. So it's, well, these dots should not be. Um... And now the Q factor of these two modes is the same, let's say 500. But over here, if you, if you start um, having this delta E principle, so the, the frequency range is stretched. And since the, the, the stretching or compression factor is the same, but the overall stretching at high frequencies is much larger. And now instead of putting here just a single carrier, we can put there a couple of carriers, for example, three of them. And also this is something that you can really exploit and, and improve it. And in addition to that, now you can also not combine just the carriers, but also combine the different modes. So we can do a readout at the first mode, a readout at the second mode and the third mode. And this is done here in this example. This is really a measurement. So we have here um, a 10 Hertz sign signal or a typical test signal. And you see here um, the demodulation of the first mode. It's usually okay, but the second mode is better. Unfortunately, the second mode, so around 50 kilohertz, is disturbed in this field a bit and largely disturbed also in this field. You see the fluctuations is a bit larger. And now you can make an SNR estimate of all the modes and then make an optimal ratio combining. This is a typical thing that you use in, in, um, well, in transmission techniques. Um, and then so SNR-based optimized combining leads actually then to, to the fact that in, in this area here, you choose more or less the green signal. And in the other signals, you use more or less the blue signals. And then the, the red one is actually better in, in all these cases. And now I stop. So a short outlook. This is a ferry that goes Actually, it's the color line that goes to, uh, to, to Norway, to, to Oslo. It's actually pretty nice on there. I mean, during the, 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 the pandemic crisis, it's not possible to use the ferry, but maybe later on. And then <laughs> there's cheap alcohol on the ship. And also Oslo is nice to see. You go there overnight, 
so pretty nice. An outlook, we have actually, uh, we are prepared for real-time measurement on heart signals. So for example, we have a bike over here and then um, the, 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 the resistance of the bike is increasing over time. So you see you start at 50 um, uh, watts and then you end up, well, at some point when you say it's enough. So um, this was my curve here. And then also my um, my pulse is increasing. And then we, we this is actually in front of a shielded chamber. We directly jumped in the shielded chamber and then we monitored how the heart is, is recovering in some sense. And this is done with a real-time process that you see over here. And then you can actually do a lot of real-time analysis something that is then explained what the medical people like. For example, this is called a so-called Poincaré plot. So you do plot uh, on the x-axis, the um, depends over here, the amount of beats that you have currently, and then the amount of beats per minute that you have one beat earlier. So if you would always have a 60 Hertz um, um, pulse, then you would just get a point in the middle. But if you, um, if you recover, then you start maybe at whatever 180 beats per minute, and then you go down to, to 60. So you create a curve. And if everything is on one straight line, then you are ill. And if the curve is, is really um, wide in that sense, then you are also ill. So the, the hyperbolic axis of this elliptic um, behavior de 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 uh, describes whether you are, you are healthy or not. So and then you can actually measure it in a magnetic fashion without any any, um, well, contact. And we have here on one hand, uh, kind of a bat. So and somewhere in this, this is over who's lying here and in the, in the blue area, this is um, the place where we put sensors. So like, as you would lay on the bat and in the, in the, in this bed, there are the sensors or we have also a chair. You, you might have seen them on, on airports when you get a massage, then you sit down in a certain fashion. Usually your face is also somewhere. Um, but this is actually, there is a, a device at, at this part of your body here. And in this part, we have also included sensors. And then you can also try to measure uh, the heart signal. And I skipped the last one. <laughs> Sorry, Johannes. Um, but actually, that's it. So I would like to thank you for your attention. And if you have a question, then please say it. Thank you so much, Gerard, for this great talk. Thank you so much. So I think we can have questions. Uh, if you want, you can type in the chat, if that's easier for you. Yeah, I see also the chat, yeah. yeah or you could just uh, click on raise hand. So if you click on participant list, there's a blue color raise hand and you can ask. So I have, I have a question, Gerard, while, uh, while students are thinking. Um, so in magnetoelectric uh, sensor design, and there's a lot of material scientists on this call, uh, and they just focus on sensitivity and designing this, these laminates such that you can push this Pico Tesla uh, level sensitivity. Is mm -hmm. it possible to use your model and back derive some criteria for this uh, this laminate that that we need this type of uh, material properties in order to exhibit uh, certain let's say noise cancellation feature in inherent noise cancellation feature for example mm -hmm. um, I would say no <laughs> because the model is too uh, is, is, is too far away from the details so you would need I would say um, fem or boundary element methods so th there is of course uh, people also over here that that uh, look in the modeling, for example, uh, Martina is Martina Garken is, is is has one project on this, and there is also one 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 listener here, um, Ömer, who is for example working on this. So this is more, I would say, from the what I have presented here on the engineering part, that you have a very rough idea of the sensor and you exploit extra stuff, for example, like extra fields and so on. However, what, what, you what you could have learned from this is that sensitivity is not everything. So if you are more and more sensitive, but on the other hand, your noise level is increasing also, then it doesn't help at all. So instead of looking at sensitivity, you might switch to SNR actually. And also sometimes a material scientist, they would like to, for example, they use a, a better Q factor. So um, you might say uh, in, 
whatever you go from from 500 to 5000 by by using vacuum stuff and so on that's nice mm -hmm. but if you are a medical person then you say hey my heart has a bandwidth of whatever 50 hertz and if you are um, a neuroscientist then you might say yeah i would like to see a couple of waves in the brain and with this very narrow stuff um, it doesn't work of course you can say then um, well i go to a very high frequency and then the q factor actually um, in combination with the high center frequency works but then you have to work also with some sort of conversion technique so i'm i'm, I'm sorry for that the model is too rough uh, that, that, that makes sense so and, and have a second question very quickly about the earth's magnetic field so so i've seen a lot of people talk about using magnetoelectric sensors to detect the changes in the pattern of the Earth's magnetic field, especially in the underwater application that you can go at the seabed and you can actually differentiate between the, the, the gradient in the magnetic field. Mm -hmm. You actually utilize that as, a, as an underwater GPS. Mm -hmm. is, that, is that a possibility or are there too much noise sources in the ocean to, to overcome this, this, this problem? Well, I would say that this is actually done with a couple of sensors. They also use OPMs, but the uh, not the the sensitive OPMs, the ones that just measure the total field, but not the the vector fields. And I would say that an an ME sensor would also be possible for this, but you cannot use every readout scheme. For example, the very basic one that I have presented, this has some trouble with with DC. So a lot of this cosine is coming back to frequency zero and then you are in trouble. But the way of, of the sensor that Franz, for example, is using, so the delta E principle, there it would be possible. But then also you, you should be careful in, in the design of the entire system. For example, a sound card, if you use a conventional sound card, it's a pretty nice AD converter card. For a hundred bucks, you get a very nice um, uh, stuff but they usually um, cannot measure zero frequency. They have usually something like at three hertz they start. So you, you must carefully also design the whole parts of it. But in principle, the ME sensor is able to do it either in, in something that we call the converse magnetoelectric effect. So you actually create a magnetic field by exciting the cantilever, and then you do a readout with coils wrapped around it. They can measure actually um, DC fields or delta E is possible, but not in the direct um, or in this frequency conversion uh, method. But it's actually a nice idea because it's it's so cheap and it's so robust against all kind of disturbing fields. You know, if you if you take an whatever a squid or an OPM, they are saturated that easily. So um, mm -hmm. and they lose a lot of of precision if they go to this total field sensor. So. It's it's a nice alternative, yeah. yeah that will be interesting to, to discuss more, yeah, for uh, especially for this uh, underwater GPS systems. Um, okay, any other questions uh, from the audience? Yeah, may I ask a question? Yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah nice talk. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, I have a question concerning that you talked a lot about noise, uh, for example, yeah, of, of the surrounding and so on, and uh, strategies against uh, this noise. And then when you realize these things as elect electronics, uh, they will again uh, create some noise. And uh, can you maybe shed light a little bit on, on that noise and uh, what's the origin or what one can do against that? Yeah, I, sorry, I didn't differentiate between all the different kinds of noise. We have magnetic noise, we have amplifier noise, uh, quantization noise, but also environmental noise in it. And from the from this high perspective, you you don't care what is what. It's more important that if the other sensor is at the noise in the one sensor is correlated with the other sensor, and that is true when you make a measurement in in a shielded or in a yeah in a shielded chamber, for example, so that. Uh, or sorry, this is the opposite in a, a non-shielded chamber where a couple of whatever power devices are creating that. 
Of course, if you design the sensor, then you must really care for that you would like to bring really the, the LOD, the limit of detection down. Then you should carefully analyze what, what is really the, the origin of the noise. And at the moment for the ME sensor, I mean, we should ask then our um, people like, like Philip, I mean, he's, he stopped it now, but Michael Höft and so on. And they said that currently the magnetic, well, noise is the dominant noise. And this means <laughs> the material science people like you are responsible for it. You should do something against this. So if, if the sensor is already as its minimum, then we can only do something with averaging. So if let's say a couple of sensors put side by side by each other and they have a different magnetic noise, then we can win by something like the square root of n, if n is the number of sensors or you do something like domain optimization and so on and bring the noise down. And I think this is currently either thermal noise or magnetic, I think magnetic noise is currently the, uh, the dominant noise source in our sensors. Does this answer your question? I mean, I'm yeah. not a material science uh, guy, so. Yeah. I think, see if there's, I guess uh, any, any other follow on question or you're okay? Like, he quit. <laughs> any other questions from the audience? Okay, if not, then let's thank Gerard. Sorry, Gerard, we can't clap and you can't listen to our clapping, but but I think everybody appreciates your beautiful talk today. And thank you very much. Yeah. Oh, okay. there it is. Yeah. <laughs> All the icons. Yeah. Thank you so much, Gerard, for this for this great presentation. Really appreciate taking all the time to talk to us. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Yeah. See you and bye bye. Bye. Take care. Yeah. Yeah. Good afternoon in uh, in Germany and and thank. Have a great day in, in US, all of you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you.